Hey everyone, thanks so much for listening to The Creedal Catholic. I want to say at the beginning of this episode, I'm sorry for the sound quality of what you're about to hear. We're on the road right now, we're moving to Colorado. I don't have any of my normal sound equipment with me. So I have this portable mic and I have I think I've figured it out now, so this sounds pretty good. But when I recorded the episode, I had the gain up a little bit too high, so you're going to hear a little bit of noise, a little bit of background echo, things like that. So I'm sorry, thanks for your patience. I'll be back next time with a much better sounding episode more like what you're used to hearing on the Vernacular Podcast Network. Thanks so much, and enjoy this episode. Hello, and welcome back to Creedal Catholic. I'm very excited to continue this podcast with you. And today we're beginning our book club series, where I hope this will be a semi-regular recurring segment on this podcast, but I hope to take a book at a time. Could be a Catholic theology book, could be another book, and break it down summarize it for you, provide some cliff notes, and then ultimately a rating. The rating system I'm going to use is one to four Thomases. It's basically the star system, but one Thomas is bad, four Thomases is good. And just as a reminder, this is after the four Thomases who are uh, who have inspired this podcast project. That's Thomas the Apostle, Thomas Aquinas, Thomas More, and Thomas Merton. So in summary, if a book has one Thomas, it's bad. If a book has four Thomases, that is really good. It's a four-star book. Okay, so today's book is Map of Life by Frank Sheed. I want to, there's a lot to cover in this book, even though it is very short, and I don't want to have this podcast run long, so I'm going to try to give you the uh, the cliff notes of my, the cliff notes of my cliff notes, which, uh, let's see, at last count, almost 5,000 notes on this, 5,000 words of notes on this book, and uh, it would take a long time to go through all of those, so I'm going to try to trim as I go. Who was Frank Sheet, first of all? Frank Sheed was an Australian-born Catholic layman. I think he died in the United States, in New Jersey or New York, uh, but he was Australian-born and was actually raised Protestant. I think his mom was Catholic, his dad was Protestant, but at age 16, he surprised his family and announced to them that he was going to become Catholic. And over the next 69 years of his life, he, as an amateur theologian and lay Catholic apologist, did a lot of work, a lot of writing, a lot of speaking, uh, trying to articulate the coherence of the faith. Um, He was the head with his wife, Maisie Ward, of the um, eponymous publishing house Sheed and Ward, which uh, no longer exists. I think it was ultimately bought out by Roman and Littlefield and uh, no uh, no longer publishes things. But he wrote about a dozen books. His autobiography is called The Church and I. I have not read it. I've read parts of his best or at least best known work, Theology and Sanity. Um, and it's very good, but very dense. So uh, if you want a more accessible entrance to the, the work of Frank Sheet, I highly recommend today's selection, which is A Map of Life. The subtitle is A Simple Study of the Catholic Faith. So this is a very short, it's about 140 pages or so, concise summary of the faith. And I think it could certainly be used in apologetics, but it isn't so much an apologetic work per se as it is more an articulation of what we believe and of how everything we believe coheres. Frank Sheet outlines as much in the introduction. He talks about how this is not an attempt to prove the truth of what is contained herein, but rather just an attempt to uh, articulate it from start to finish and provide it from the perspective of the map maker. In that case, this is God, who has created this map. And um, and so this is a, a, a sort of mile high look at what we believe. So he says, this is how the map works. There are 14 chapters, and he sort of walks through the map piece by piece. And these are the chapters. I'll just read them to you so you sort of understand the arc, and then I'll, I'll work through each of the chapters one by one, giving us a sort of two-minute summary on each. The chapters are named, uh, one, the problem of life's purpose, two, the problem of life's laws, three, heaven, four, the creation and the fall, five, the incarnation, six, the mystical body of Christ, seven, truth, the teaching church, Eight, truth, the mystery of the Trinity. Nine, law and sin. Ten, law and suffering. Eleven, the supernatural life, how it comes to the soul. Twelve, the supernatural life, how it works in the soul. Thirteen, hell. And fourteen, purgatory, colon, heaven. So as I mentioned, I want to take each of these and talk about them for two minutes or so, providing an overview, and then wrap up with some concluding thoughts on the book as a whole. So let's dive right in here and get started, because there is a lot to talk about, and I don't want to take too much of your time. Uh, So let's go with problem of life's purpose. Now, At the outset of this discussion, she talks about how man is unique and that man is a union of matter and spirit. We're not pure spirit like angels. We're not pure matter like trees or dogs. We're between these two worlds by our very essence, and we are embodied souls, union of body and soul. 
And then Sheet makes another important assertion here. You don't know what anything is until you know what it is for. So we can't properly understand ourselves unless we understand what the Greeks would call the final cause, the purpose, the telos, the end of man. And the best way to know what something is for, or the best way to know our, our end, our purpose, our telos, our final cause, is to find out directly from our maker. This is what the Catholic does when he or she learns from divine revelation, when we learn from the sacred scripture, or when we learn from sacred tradition, uh, as it was has been transmitted from Jesus through the, the apostolic authority. But um, it is possible, of course, to try to induce man's telos, induce our purpose from our nature, but, there, but there's a crucial problem here, as she points out, and that's that any attempt to do so necessarily assumes that our purpose is not higher than our nature. If we are starting from our nature, as a starting point and trying to determine what we are for, that will only give us any reasonable answer or any a true answer if it is true that our purpose is not higher than our nature as it is now. And so if we believe as Catholics that our nature is corrupted and there is a problem with original sin, then it will be impossible for us to properly, uh, properly induce our, our purpose from our fallen nature. And that's why we need divine revelation. Now, the practical man might say, I'm, un I'm unconcerned with these questions. I don't really need to know my purpose. All I want to do is help people here and now. Well, Sheet says, and I think rightly, that that's a pretty absurd point of view because it's the very highest act of our intellect to grasp the revelation of God. And this is knowledge that we must have and knowledge that we have to be either told or to do without. Sheet says that if a man knows what knowing means, he cannot even think he knows man's true purpose save through the revelation of God, and so he cannot direct his own life rightly, nor can he help others. So in Sheet's telling, and again, I think this is right, if the man wants to direct his own life rightly, he needs, he needs to answer these questions, or at least ask these questions in a way of trying to get at the answers. Sheet wraps up this chapter by, by saying that any religious teacher must answer two questions. One, what is the purpose of man's life? And two, how do you know? The Catholic Church, he says, has answers to both. And then we lead into chapter two, the problem of life's laws. This is one of the shorter chapters, but I think it's one of the most profound. Sheet says that very early in life, man realizes that he lives under a particular set of laws. I'm thinking here, as I was reading this, of my son, who is just learning to sit up. And he's already learning, as he does this, about the law of gravity, right? He has to keep himself upright unless he wants to fall and and hit his face on the floor, right? We try to catch him, obviously, when he does that, but we, we don't always... Uh, and he falls sometimes and gets hurt. So he's learning the law of gravity, and he's learning, more importantly, that he cannot change this law no matter how hard he wants to. Whenever he loses his balance, he will fall and possibly get hurt. But he's growing into this understanding and realizing, if only subconsciously now, that he has no say on whether or not gravity exists. So this, in a nutshell, she says, is the problem of life's laws. Man yearns for freedom, but fundamentally, we cannot be free from these laws. We Now, now even just looking at, look at the law of a state, right? We can escape civil authorities, we can flout moral teaching, we can skydive in the face of gravity, but we cannot escape the consequences of the laws. When we skydive, we need a parachute if we want to survive the reality of gravity. There is, she says, no such thing as true freedom from laws. There is only freedom within them. This is a really important next assertion. He says, just as there are material laws like gravity or quantum mechanics, there are also moral laws. And just as a man can never decide to do away with gravity, so he can also never decide to do away with, for example, a prohibition on murder. And yes, a murderer can and does contradict the moral law when he commits murder, but uh, just as a skydiver can refuse to don a parachute and try to contradict the law of gravity, there are perilous end results, right? The end result in the case of the skydiver is destruction of the body. The end result for the case of the murderer is destruction uh, not no, maybe not destruction. That's a poor, poor, poor choice. The end result for the murderer is uh, uh, damage or injury to the soul, right? And so, as as we flout our moral laws, um, these have consequences, if unseen, um, sometimes felt, I think, but uh, but unseen often uh, consequences for our souls. So this is the problem of life's laws. We can uh, we cannot escape them. We cannot escape the consequences, even if we can disobey them, right? So to make this uh, more concrete, perhaps, a state can, for example, legalize divorce. There are only two states in the entire world that have not. That's the Philippines and Vatican City. But it cannot make divorce less injurious to the soul, right? So we can, f we can uh, flout moral laws, but we cannot escape the consequences. But here's the part of the, the she chapter uh, that was really op eye-opening to me. I've always had a hard time understanding the Pauline discourses about being a slave of Christ. I mean, look at... Uh, Romans chapter 7, for example, when, when Paul has this great discourse on what it means to be a slave of Christ and to be truly free. 
right? There's a paradoxical assertion in Christian theology that true freedom entails bondage to Christ. And Sheed helped me here in his explanation because he says that we normally think of freedom as defined as the power to do what one likes. But he says, since we all operate under the law, we necessarily have to do what we ought in order to do what we like. So think, for example, of a, you know, a type 2 diabetic who likes to eat chocolate chip cookies. Um, that diabetic, if he or she really wants to eat chocolate chip cookies, he, he or she must not always eat chocolate chip cookies because by doing what they ought and not always eating the chocolate chip, chocolate chip cookies, they create freedom for themselves to sometimes eat chocolate chip cookies without uh, uh, damaging their body, right? And so by doing what we ought, we actually create the freedom to do what we like because if we, uh, if we um, always do what we like, we will inevitably create injury to our soul because we are fundamentally oriented in our basic uh, original will uh, towards sin and towards ultimately our destruction because sin, the end of sin, is destruction. So in doing what we ought, it is our wills that are gradually, slowly but gradually reoriented towards the final cause of our being, which affords us the true freedom that we ultimately all seek. So this is the paradox of life's laws or the problem of life's laws as she outlines them. Then we get to chapter three on heaven. Now heaven is essentially the Catholic answer to what comes in the afterlife, right? Every uh, every religion or almost every religion uh, since the beginning of time has delved into this question because what comes after death is a huge mystery. Um, but heaven is the Catholic answer to what that is, right? Uh, and more broadly, it's a Christian answer, but, but uh, the Catholic answer is, is heaven as well. Now here, Sheed points out what N.T. Wright said in his book, Surprised by Hope, and this was really helpful to me becoming Catholic, even though Wright is not Catholic. <laughs> so much of Christian teaching, Sheed writes, and N.T. Wright points this out as well, uh, about heaven is caught up in images of angels and harps and floating on clouds, but none of that is even remotely biblical or supported by Christian tradition. When I was a kid, I basically thought of heaven as a place of unbridled hedonism, right? I could have all the chocolate chip cookies I could, I could ever want. I could uh, do whatever I wanted all the time, go on roller coasters, whatever, right? Do fun things all day. And this sounds fun for a little bit as a kid, but ultimately it sort of troubled me as well because even a kid understands that doing that much of a good thing can eventually get boring, right? Um, even a kid recognizes the very real possibility of a stomach ache from too much chocolate or the worst consequence of all for a child, boredom. So fortunately, heaven is not unbridled pleasure. Rather, she writes, quote, heaven consists in the knowledge of God and in the love of God. And now he acknowledges, and, and rightly as well, this also sort of bored me as a child. When you think about heaven in this way, to some men, this might sound boring and unsatisfying. But I think maybe better to think about it this way. Deep in the soul of man is a recognition that our nature, as it is now, is not suited to our end or our purpose. So our corrupted nature is unable to live the life of heaven where every thirst is satisfied and man's purpose is complete and perfected. She calls this ineffable intimacy with God. That is what heaven is. Now, she doesn't talk about this here, um, but I have in mind the doctrine of divinization or theosis in which man becomes God. This is not a frequently discussed part of Catholic theology, but it is there all the same, and it's very important. It's the flip side of the incarnation. At, at my church this morning, my pastor, uh, on, at, uh, celebrating the ascension this morning, my pastor gave a, a homily on the ascension and what it means for the incarnation and how it is basically the completion of the incarnation because Jesus Christ in the incarnation at the Annunciation becomes man, God becomes man, and, and in the Ascension, man, the God-man, ascends to God and thereby basically creates the bridge for us to God. And man right now, because of the God-man, is in heaven in full union with God. So as the, the Catholic Church's Catechism, section 460 puts it, for the Son of God became man so that we might become God. Right? This is what heaven is about. We become God, not in the sense that we become small deities up there, but in the sense that heaven is uh, unbridled, unalloyed, complete, ineffable, perfect union with God. Okay, now chapter four, the creation and the fall. This is also one of the shortest chapters in the book because it is simple but profound. Man needs three things to fulfill his supernatural destiny, she writes, and this is really important in the rest of the book. The first two are contained in what she calls the twofold truth. That is knowledge of the purpose of life and knowledge of the laws that need to be obeyed, right? So that those are the first two things man needs, knowledge of the purpose of life and knowledge of the laws to be obeyed in life. And then the third thing man needs is the supernatural life. So how this relates to creation of the fall 
is all about Adam, right? The first man, representative of the entire human race, had all three of these things originally. He had knowledge of his purpose. He had knowledge of the laws that led him to his end, his purpose, and the supernatural life. He walked with God in the cool of the day, right? That is the supernatural life, right? That is union with God. But then, quote, man wrecked the scheme. That's what Sheet says. He says, man disobeyed God and lost for himself the supernatural life. The only exception since Adam is Mary, who possessed the supernatural life from the moment of her conception. Um, we, we can talk about that a lot more. He doesn't doesn't delve into it too much in this book. There's a footnote later, uh, but it's very important. Uh, and in the typology of Mary as the new Eve, uh, it all it all makes sense and it all coheres. But back to Adam, this is why we have original sin. Adam lost for humanity the supernatural life. And so original sin, understood in this sense, is not the sin committed by us personally, but is the loss of the supernatural life that our race through Adam has forfeited, and which our race through Christ, the new Adam, going back to the typology point, has regained. Now more on that in just a bit. That's chapter four. Chapter five, the incarnation. Now remember those three things that man needs for the supernatural life, right? The twofold knowledge of the truth, right? This, that's the knowledge of our purpose and the knowledge of life's laws and the supernatural life. Those are the three things. This is why the incarnation is important. These three things are what Jesus promises us in the Gospel of John, right? He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So just as Adam lost those three things for us, Christ regains those things for us or brings them back to us. He claims to be the savior of the race who restores us to supernatural life. And in, in this uh, in a, a sort of brief aside here in the chapter, she draws on the rich Christological tradition of the fathers who spent a lot of time thinking, talking, debating, writing about who Christ is, right? This is Christology. He is truly God and truly man. He has a real human body and a real human soul. He is one person with two natures, divine and human. And so as to the distinction between human and nature, I found this very helpful as well. She says that nature is all about the, the answer to the question, what is he, right? What am I? I am a human. Person is the answer to the question, who is he? So who am I? I am Zach, right? Uh, my nature is human because I'm human. My person is Zach. So to take this further, it is nature that describes or limits what we do, right? I can only do those things that are proper to a human because I am human. I am, I am a human who possesses human nature. I cannot, for example, create out of nothing ex nihilo because that power is unique to God's nature and only God has that power. But it is not my nature that does the things that I do. Rather, it is I, the person of Zach, right? Zach does the things, not, not human. It doesn't make sense to say human does the things, right? Zach, the person, does the things that are proper to the sphere of the human because that is my nature, right? So the person of Zach does the things that are within the bounds set by my nature, my human nature. So to put it in Sheed's signature pithiness, quote, the person acts and the nature is that principle in him that decides his sphere of action, end quote. So in this sense, the person of Christ, who is fully God and fully man, could act in the human sphere of action or in the divine sphere of action because he had those two natures, the human nature and the divine nature. He was fully both. But it was always Jesus, the Christ, the person of Jesus, the one person, two natures, who acted. And this matters because it's only the God-man in the incarnation, through the incarnation, who could actually bring about the reconciliation of God and man. Jesus' acts were truly human acts. But they were divine because they were done by the person of Jesus, who is God made man. And thus everything the person of Jesus did was of infinite value because he was God. And that is how he could repair the bridge between God and man and restore us to the supernatural life. This right here, this is the central mystery of the incarnation. It is also why it is so essential that we get the nature of Christ correct. Christology, the study of Christ, is soteriology or the understanding of how we are saved. And this is why Jesus rightly says that he is the life. When he says the way, the truth, and the life, this is why he is the life. He is the life. Now back to the way and the truth. This is where she reflects on Christ as teacher because he teaches us both of these things. Remember the twofold truth, right? What are the three things man needs? Knowledge of life's purpose, knowledge of life's laws, and the supernatural life. So we've already talked about how, in the, how through the incarnation, Jesus restores us to the supernatural life. And now we're, we're back to the way and the truth, right? This is the twofold truth. The knowledge of our ultimate end is the truth, right? This is our place in creation. We shall love the Lord our God with all of our heart and with all of our soul and with all of our might. This is our purpose. This is the truth. And the second law is like unto it. And this is where Jesus uh, recovers for us the, uh, the knowledge of life's laws. We should love our neighbors as ourselves. In these two commandments, Jesus sums up the Mosaic law and restores to mankind the twofold truth that we lost. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets.
All right, now following the incarnation, she goes into chapter six, the mystical body of Christ. At the end of the incarnation chapter, he says that the question still remains, how does man access the supernatural life with the gifts that Christ brought? And the answer in the Catholic understanding is the church, the mystical body of Christ. Christ instituted the church and commissioned the apostles to go forth and make disciples, and he gave them apostolic authority to transmit the way, the truth, and the life, the twofold truth and the supernatural life. Okay. Now, if the church is the transmitter of these three necessities for mankind, the twofold truth and the supernatural life, then it follows that she must transmit truth reliably and mediate the sacraments regularly. And this she does. She transmits the twofold truth. We might call this faith. That is the purpose of life, right? And morals, that's the, that's the uh, knowledge of life's laws infallibly, and she incorporates the believer through baptism and the Eucharist into the supernatural life. Now, it's worth pointing out, especially in this age, that the church presents herself under a double aspect. That's the wording of Sheed. He says that insofar as the church is Christ living in its members, she is perfect, right? Christ perfects the church. This is, for example, how the magisterium can be guarded from error. This is how the Eucharist can dispense the supernatural life. Now, because the church is is presented under a double aspect when the church is considered by her constituent parts, her constituent human parts, these people fall short and often uh, sometimes very far short, as she says. The fallibility of men in the church has no bearing on the supernatural life, which she, through Christ as her bridegroom, offers, though, because Jesus and the church together are perfect because he sanctifies her, even though her members are far from perfect and far from fully sanctified. So this is very important, I say, especially in this age, because uh, the Catholic Church or the members of the Catholic Church have failed utterly and failed miserably in upholding the moral teaching of the Church. And there are countless people who have been damaged and uh, in, in some cases destroyed uh, by people in the Church, in some cases high-ranking clerics. So it's very important to remember this twofold aspect of the Church and how the Church is simultaneously divine and thus perfect, uh, and human and thus very imperfect. Okay, chapter seven, truth, the teaching church. She devotes this very short chapter to discussing the teaching authority of the church, and I don't want to spend too much time on it, but I do think it's important to, to highlight two things. First, she talks about the development of doctrine. Now, I want to discuss John Henry Newman's seminal essay in a later podcast uh, on the development of doctrine, but she here distinguishes between the development of doctrine in the church and the progress of science. So some people want to draw comparisons to the development of doctrine and the progress of science uh, in the sense that science progresses, right? We understand new things about science just as we do the development of doctrine. But the analogy really doesn't carry much water because science progresses by revising itself repeatedly, right? We once thought that the earth was the center of the solar system. And once we discovered that was not the case, we discarded that old hypothesis and came up with a new one, the heliocentric model. And that's what we base our truth on now. If we were to discover that Jupiter is the center of the solar system, then we would cast off this, the heliocentric model and uh, make a Jupiter-centric model, right? That's how science progresses, by casting off the old ideas as wrong and advancing new ones in their stead that better comport with reality as it is and as it is understood by us. The church, on the other hand, develops doctrine by discovering and uncovering further truths that elucidate and indeed develop the old. So at each stage, writes Sheed, all that the church teaches is true. At no stage does she teach all that is contained in the truth. So basically what he's saying is that the church is never wrong, but the church always has more to uncover, right? And as she does so, this, this uh, uh, unveils more of the previous truth so that we can see more and more of it, right? And logically speaking, this makes sense. If the truths that the church proclaims have their origins in the unfathomable and infinite depths of God, then wouldn't the church have unending source material for uncovering and elucidating these truths? If we believe that God is an infinite being, then is, aren't there infinite things that we can learn about this infinite being, right? So the development of doctrine is something that must be necessary because uh, in that sense, the, the entire knowledge of, or the entire body of knowledge about God can never be fully uncovered because it is infinite, okay? Now, the second topic in this chapter also bears mentioning, I think, he talks about the infallibility of the magisterium. There are two misconceptions that he wants to clear up, and I think it's important to do so here as well. One, individual bishops can err. Arius, for example, was a bishop. He erred very badly in the Arian uh, heresy. Um, the dogma of the infallibility of the magisterium means that the bishops, as a, as a teaching body as a whole, cannot err on matters of faith and morals, which is why church councils, for example, are infallible. 
Now, the Pope's infallibility uh, can stand apart from the rest of the bishops uh, when he's speaking uh, ex cathedra, basically from the chair in his capacity as the Pope, the head of the College of Bishops, etc. And that is, again, a, a logical necessity um, coming from his, his need to sometimes arbitrate disputes between bishops, even if those disputes are in good faith. So that's the first thing. The second is the infallibility of the bishops, including the Pope, does not say anything at all about their personal moral certitude. Right, so the, the these bishops' protection from error on doctrinal or dogmatic pronouncements doesn't magically make sin less attractive to them or salvation any easier. It just means that God won't let them err when teaching others on faith and morals. Right, that, that's all it means. Right, the dogma of infallibility I think follows logically from our Christology. If Jesus is the way and the truth, don't we need to know what the way and the truth are? And wouldn't we need to trust His Church to teach these accurately? Okay, so that's the first part, truth, the teaching church. The second chapter, uh, chapter eight, uh, is truth, the mystery of the Trinity. Sheet has a really great interest in the Trinity. He devotes a large portion of his book, Theology and Sanity, to it um, in, in defending why it's logical, uh, but it's still very much a mystery. And, and Sheet says that whenever we deal with God, there necessarily must be mystery because, going back to the point about uh, the development of doctrine, God is immeasurable and infinite. And because he's immeasurable and infinite and eternal and incomparable and transcendent and, and unfathomable and all these things, um, every time we deal with the truth of God, it will be up. It will be necessarily beyond the fullness of our understanding because our minds are finite, right? But just because something is a mystery doesn't mean that we can't know anything about it, says Sheed. It just means that we can't know everything about it. Now, I refer you to the Athanasian Creed to look at, uh, for example, the most succinct and complete articulation of the mystery of the Trinity. Uh, there's a link in the show notes if you want to see it. But for Sheed's purposes, this should suffice. He says, the central mystery of the Trinity is that, quote, in the unity of the Godhead, there are three persons truly distinct. Okay, now this sounds illogical, perhaps. This sounds like maybe a contradiction. Now, she goes on, though, to say that there's no true contradiction in this claim, logically speaking. He says that there are two claims that appear to be at odds, and as is the case with many of these mysteries, uh, the, the man who evaluates them has two responses. The first is that he can assert that these two claims are indeed irreconcilable. This is a true contradiction. The second is that the man can acknowledge that they may be reconcilable, but at a depth that his mind cannot fully grasp, right? And so she says this is the way it is with the Trinity. I would add that this is the same way with every mystery, just because uh, in the same way that she says every mystery uh, of God is going to be not fully uh, grasped by finite man, the incarnation, the paschal mystery, the resurrection, the ascension, so on, uh, a countless number are mysteries that cannot be fully grasped by man and are full of what may be apparent uh, irreconcilable differences or contradictions or things that don't make sense, but that doesn't mean that they are not true just because we can't fully grasp them. And I don't want to gloss over the great stuff that Sheet has on the Trinity, but I will for now with one exception. He writes that the mystery of the Trinity, like all great mysteries of God, is an invitation for further meditation and contemplation. And when I was reading this, I was reminded of, of Luke chapter 2, verse 19, in which Mary, after the Annunciation, another of these amazing mysteries that inaugurates the Incarnation, after the, the uh, Annunciation, when Gabriel visits her, she ponders all of these things in her heart. It sounds like she's just contemplating the mystery of the Incarnation. And I just think that's so cool that Mary models for us the way that she just sits there and ponders this, right? How can these things, how can these things be? How can this be since I, uh, since I know no man, right? How is it that, um, that God should come to me, right? That's incredible. Um, chapter 9 is Law and Sin. I just want to mention very quickly that this chapter has two central ideas. One is the necessity of the church for teaching us the law. And the other is the problem of sin and the separation that it creates from God. I want to then then advance from that into chapter 10, which is law and suffering. Now, problematically, the resistance to sin and the following of the law often entails some level of suffering. We often sin because it is the easier, more pleasurable, or less painful route to take. So to avoid sin is often to invite suffering. And this is one of the problems with, uh, with law and suffering. But a central claim of this chapter, and I think it's really important here to recognize, is that suffering is not necessarily an evil. She, write, she writes that, quote, a thing is evil if it hinders a being in the attainment of the purpose for which the being exists. Or more pithily, quote, a thing is evil for man only if it makes it more difficult for him to save his soul. So, in other words, while suffering can injure the soul, it can also enrich the soul, right? Each man gets to decide which his path will be, 
and some people will be given more suffering than others, but it's very important to note that no man will be given more suffering than God will allow, and God will not allow more suffering to be given someone than he can bear with the aid of God's grace. This is why the church, while seeing it certainly as an important task to alleviate the suffering of people, provide food for the uh, food for the hungry, a shelter for the homeless, clothes for the naked, etc. The church also recognizes, recognizes that suffering can be a great good. And a man can unite his suffering and should unite his suffering to that of Christ on the cross, offering up his suffering for the whole body of Christ. This is exactly why Paul says in Colossians 1.24, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. So what is Paul doing? He is offering up his sufferings, filling up what he says is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. Now, he's certainly not asserting that there is anything uh, incomplete about Christ's suffering. But what he's saying is that as a member of the mystical body of Christ, as a full member of the body of Christ, he can participate in the suffering of Christ and unite his sufferings to Christ for the sake of the church. That's exactly what the suffering Catholics should do. Chapter 11 is the supernatural life, how it comes to the soul, uh, and now we're sort of coming to the conclusion of the map. How does supernatural life come to the soul? She writes that man is incorporated by rebirth into the mystical body through the sacrament of baptism, right? That's the sacrament of initiation. Man directs his life to God through prayer, which is made up of adoration, thanksgiving, sorrow for sin, and petition. And the prayer of every Christian is is part of the prayer of the whole church, which finds its source and summit and full form in the Mass, which is ultimately the prayer and offering of Christ, to which the prayer of every Christian is united in the mystical body of Christ. The Mass is then a special prayer that is in that it is offered by Christ himself through the priest who acts in the person of Christ, that's in persona Christi. And second, the thing offered is Christ himself. So Christ offers the prayer, and Christ himself is the offering who comes to us in the Mass, appearing as bread and wine, but really and substantially present in the elements. The Mass is really heaven breaking through to earth to be seen of men, writes Sheed. And then the faithful, of course, consume Christ and so partake of the supernatural life. That's how, primarily, it comes to the soul. The other sacraments also uh, help the supernatural life arrive in the soul. They work as material signs of immaterial graces. These, of course, include penance, matrimony, extreme unction, or last rites, ordination, and confirmation. And this is kind of neat. She points out that the life of man has certain fixed points, right? Man is born, man grows to manhood or maturity, uh, man is married, man dies. And for each of these, there's a sacrament. For the birth, there's baptism. For growth to manhood, there's confirmation. For marriage, there's either marriage or ordination. Uh, and for death, there's extreme unction or last rites. For each of these, there's a sacrament, um, and along the way, uh, there is the Eucharist and penance for our regular participation and growth in and increase in the supernatural life. And finally, the supernatural life comes to the soul through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. This is especially appropriate for this week, in fact, as we approach Pentecost, uh, when we celebrate when the disciples received the Holy Spirit and were anointed by the Holy Spirit in the upper room. So nine days after the ascension, they were all gathered in the upper room, and then they received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And right before Jesus ascended, he said, receive the Holy Spirit. So that's the final way in which the supernatural life comes to the soul. It's through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in the soul of the Christian. The 12th chapter is the supernatural life, how it works in the soul. And this chapter contains a brief primer on metaphysics of the soul. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but she explains that the soul has two faculties, intellect and will. And after the Catholic enters into the supernatural life, uh, he receives supernaturalizing grace. Or I should say, as he enters into the supernatural life, he receives supernaturalizing grace. That transforms the intellect and the will, right? So before supernaturalizing grace, uh, man has intellect and will. The intellect seeks to know truth, and the will seeks to love goodness, right? So the intellect, uh, the action associated with the intellect is to know the object is truth, right? So the intellect seeks to know truth. The will, uh, the will is oriented towards the action of love, and the object of that love is goodness. So the will seeks to love goodness. But after supernaturalizing grace intervenes, and after the supernatural life arrives in the soul, the will now also hopes, and the intellect, instead of just seeking to know truth, now places faith in God. And in, in addition to hoping, the will loves, but instead of the object of that love being simply goodness, now the object of the love is the love of God. 
and that love of God becomes the root of all his other loves. So when St. Paul extols faith, hope, and love, but adds that the greatest of these is love, that's because in heaven faith is no longer needed, because the intellect will apprehend God face to face, and the will will no longer hope, because all of its longing will be satisfied in God, and so all that will remain is love, love of God and the love for all that springs from the love of God, in immeasurable and infinite quantity, because the believer will be united to God, Remember back to the doctrine of divinization or theosis. And so that love will be immeasurable and infinite, just as God is immeasurable and infinite. Now, the supernaturalizing of the soul is, she writes, the first result of the possession of supernatural life. The second result is that the believer is enabled to merit a supernatural reward. But it's important to note here that this is not about works salvation or works righteousness. This is not about actually the, uh, the, the uh, this is not about man's um, own merits. This is about the merits of Christ that are actually and really made our own by the infusing of Christ's grace. And the third result is that man's soul is fitted for life in heaven because as we participate in an increase in this supernatural life, we become more like God um, as our disordered affections are reordered. And the fourth result is that we, by grace, actually become children of God. And this is why the most of the Pauline epistles include reference to our adoption as sons of God. We're really and truly grafted in to the mystical body of Christ. And this is why I think the uh, Catholic understanding of infused righteousness is so much more powerful and so much more gospel-centric than the sort of Lutheran or um, Calvinistic idea of imputed righteousness. Okay, the final two chapters are lumped together. That's hell and purgatory and heaven. The soul is eternal and does not perish because uh, it is eternal. Death, however, does make the body perish, and it's final in some sense because it is in this life that our will can choose God with eternal consequences. At our bodily death, our will has its orientation fixed. It has either chosen God or it has rejected him, either explicitly or implicitly. Now, the former, the sort of explicit rejection of God, is pretty rare, although maybe becoming more and more common now as there are many atheists who explicitly reject God. But I think more common, and she writes this is the case, is a sort of um, self-love or uh, idolatrousness that is an implicit rejection of God because we have actively chosen to worship and love something um, at the expense of God. And this is the key thing to understand about hell. It's not a place of suffering to which God damns souls who don't pay him homage. Instead, it is a place of the sinner's own choosing because he has rejected God. And on this point, one can think of the uh, C.S. Lewis book, The Great Divorce, where he basically talks about hell as a place of the sinner's choosing. She writes that if any soul in hell would turn to God and ask for mercy, God would grant his prayer. But the problem is the souls in hell will not ask. They hate their sufferings, but they hate God more. That is, that is hell, a place of the sinner's own choosing because the sinner has actively rejected God. Purgatory, however, is entirely different. I talked about this a little bit in my second episode of Credo Catholic and in my own sort of intellectual conversion story. Purgatory is totally different. It is not for souls who have rejected God with finality, um, not even for souls who have rejected God with some degree of uh, ambiguity. It's for those who have died in the love of God, but in an imperfect state of their soul because their, uh, because their soul has some sort of temporal consequences of sin on it, right? And so because of those temporal consequences of sin, the soul needs to be cleansed. And that soul is cleansed in purgatory, which is the existential state in which a soul is united with God, right? So as they encounter God face to face, God burns away all of the dross and rust and hay and wood and straw that has accumulated on that person's soul as a result of the sins that they've committed in this life. Because the sins that we commit in this life still matter and still have consequences, even if we accept the free grace of God and forgiveness through Jesus Christ. So that's what purgatory is about, right? And whether purgatory is necessary or not for each individual soul, the souls who die in the love of God are bound for heaven, right? If you're in purgatory, you're going to heaven. It's great news. Um, and that's where they will encounter God face to face. The happiness of heaven is perfect, complete, and indescribable to our finite minds. And at the last resurrection, the bodies and souls of men will be, re will be reunited to be with Christ or to be without him forever. That's the end of the chapter, the final chapter of Frank Sheed's A Map of Life. So what do we think about this book? As I was reading it, I was really struck by his ability to articulate in key and pithy phrases what we believe as Catholics. And I think this book is remarkable because it is, you know, when, when you look at the catechism, the catechism, I think, is a wonderful document because it makes the truth of the faith cohere very, very well. But at the same time, the Catholic catechism is a thousand page document that takes a long time to digest. Uh, 
and includes a lot of things in there that are absolutely wonderful to learn and to understand, but are not uh, not essential for uh, sort of understanding the basics of the faith, right? Um, and so what is remarkable about A Map of Life is that this is 140 pages that gets to the heart of the matter, truly, about what the Catholic believes, and yet at the same time is able to tackle a lot of the complicated uh, questions. It doesn't talk a lot about the sinlessness of Mary, but it does sort of acknowledge and and give some footnote explanations as to why that's important. Uh, talks about purgatory at length, right? It talks even about, I didn't talk about it in this in this podcast summary, but it talks even a little bit about the relationship that real Christians on earth now have with saints who are in heaven, right? So there's some mention of the intercession of the saints, and all of it is presented in a way that is remarkably cogent and clear and makes sense in an almost chronological uh, chronological order because he starts with uh, the origin of man and man's purpose and creation in the fall and ends with uh, heaven and hell and purgatory and where we're going. So I highly, highly recommend this. Um, for every Catholic and non-Catholic to read and to understand. For Catholics, it's great to understand more about your faith. I learned a lot through this book. And it's also really good to um, to understand all that presented in a, in, a, uh, in a single and systematic way. I also think it's really good to, to learn from in the sense that you can talk about the faith in better ways to people who aren't as familiar with it, non- non-Christians um, or Christians alike. How does what the Catholic Church believe differ from what anybody else believes about the origins of man, about his ultimate destination, about what the church is, about uh, the saving sacrifice of Christ on the cross and the paschal mysteries and the mystery of the Trinity? All of these things are really remarkably presented in this book in a very accessible and digestible way. And I think this is a really good, not as an apologetic work to prove why things are right, but you know, a central thing that I find that that people need to understand when I have apologetic discussions with people who are not Christians, the central thing that they want to know is, does it make sense? Is there internal coherence to this? I think there are two questions, right? With any belief system that is believed by anybody, when you're evaluating that for yourself, you want to know, one, does it make sense internally? And two, is it validated externally? And this book is a testament to the fact that the Catholic faith does absolutely make sense internally. It doesn't really try to answer the question of whether or not it is validated externally, although I think man's experience uh, certainly comports with some of what this book talks about uh, vis-a-vis man's nature and his purpose and ultimate end. But really this book is about explaining everything that the church believes and why each belief necessarily follows from the other. And for that, it's a remarkable work. So it's limited in scope, but by design, because she didn't didn't set out to make a brilliant apologetic work, but it is very, very effective at doing what it does, and that is pre- presenting a map of life, a simple study of the Catholic faith. So at the end of the day, I give this book four Thomases. I think it's great. I think it's a very worthy read, and I highly commend uh, highly commend it to you and recommend that you pick up a copy. You can click the link in the show notes if you want to pick up a copy for yourself. I will mention that the Ignatius edition I have, I'm normally very happy with Ignatius and I think they're a wonderful publishing house. I've read a lot of books of theirs. This edition is, um, it's called a Special Lighthouse Catholic Media Edition. I don't know, I got it on Thrift Books. It was just a used book copy. It has a surprising number of typos. I don't know why why that's the case. I'm guessing it was sort of optically scanned from an early edition of the book. Um, The link that I have in Amazon is supposed to be a full facsimile, not an optical uh, rescanned edition. So hopefully it will avoid those typos. But just just be warned of that if you're picking up uh, a copy of this. All right, that's it. Four Thomases for A Map of Life. I encourage you to read it. And I'd love to hear from you if you've read this book or haven't read this book or have any other questions about anything else I've said on the uh, Credo Catholic. Would love to hear from you. You can reach out at Credo Catholic at vernacularpodcast.com. Lots of exciting content coming up. I'm so excited to continue this podcast and talk more about the truths of the Catholic faith. It's been a lot of fun so far. I've enjoyed some of the feedback I've gotten from the few episodes that I have already published, and I would love to hear ideas on future topics or other things that we could talk about coming up. I have some interesting guests coming up as well, and I'm excited to share those with you as we move further along. So thank you once again for listening to The Credo Catholic. I also encourage you to check out all the other stuff on the Vernacular Podcast Network. Just this week, we have a a cool episode with Nate Seipt uh, on Vernacular Podcast about making coffee um, and how uh, coffee is an important part of being human as we embrace the material uh, side of our material spiritual unions. 
uh, we should enjoy coffee. And Nate gives us some great pointers on enjoying coffee. You can also tune into Breaking Pod to hear about Breaking Bad, the best TV show ever made. Uh, and uh, my friends Josh and Maureen Goldman over at the Popcast can keep you updated on everything going on in pop culture. So check out the Vernacular Podcast Network wherever you get your podcasts. You can go to vernacularpodcast.com. You can also go to patreon.com slash VPN for Vernacular Podcast Network. If you want to uh, read more about what we're doing and our mission at Vernacular Podcast Network and maybe even donate and become a patron. So thank you so much for listening. I look forward to bringing you more content on Credo Catholic. Thank you for your support and may God bless you. Thank you.